Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is in continuation of the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease series. In this, we will be discussing about bronchiectasis. If you recollect, in the earlier two videos, I had discussed about the general principles of obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases. I had discussed in detail about emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So, in this session, Let's learn about the uh, concepts of bronchiectasis, the definition, the pathogenesis, the clinical features, the morphology, the diagnosis and treatment aspects and a bit about the complications of bronchiectasis. Now, what is bronchiectasis? As the name says, if we can split this, it is bronchi plus ectasia. Ectasia meaning dilatation. So, bronchiectasis means it's an abnormal and permanent dilatation of bronchi and bronchioles. Why are these bronchi and bronchioles dilated? That's because of destruction of the smooth muscle and the elastic tissue of the bronchi and bronchioles. And why are these destroyed? That's due to persistent or severe infections of the respiratory tract, right? So, bronchiectasis is basically abnormal and permanent dilatation of bronchi and bronchioles. Bronchiectasis actually nowadays uh, is quite uncommon, that's because of better control of infections. But having said that, you need to be aware of various risk factors which predispose to the development of bronchiectasis. And what are those risk factors? The most common risk factors, you know, these risk factors can be classified under various categories. The most common one being congenital or hereditary conditions which predispose to the chronic infections. What are these conditions? They can be cystic fibrosis, they can, they, it could be intralobar sequestration of the lung, it could be various immunodeficiency states, primary ciliary dyskinesia and Tata Jenner syndrome. So, what really happens in all these conditions is that there will be impaired mucociliary clearance mechanism and the defense mechanism is lost in the form of uh, improper secretion of mucus and all those things. So, all these things predispose to the development of chronic or recurrent infections. The second important risk factor being severe necrotizing pneumonias. Okay, And these necrotizing pneumonias can be due to bacterial or viral or even fungal infections. So, whatever it is, these nef necrotizing inf infections serve as a risk factor for the development of bronchiectasis. Bronchial obstruction, regardless of cause, can be a risk factor for the development of bronchiectasis and the obstruction could be because of tumor, could be because of foreign body or because of impaction of the mucus. Okay. It could be because of immune disorders like for example, you know, it could be because of rheumatoid arthritis because due to systemic lupus erythematosus, the inflammatory bowel disease and various graft versus host diseases. So, these are the various risk factors which are associated with bronchiectasis. There is another risk factor which is idiopathic. You know, when you don't find any cause, you call it as idiopathic and that accounts to around 50% of the cases of bronchiectasis. Right now, what is the pathogenesis of bronchiectasis? We know that the two most common things are the obstruction and infection. Right, so what really happens when there is an obstruction? That obstruction could lead to impairment of mucociliary clearance, and that results in pooling of secretions distal to the obstruction. And because of pooling of secretion distal to the obstruction, which further leads to the development of inflammation. Okay. And this inflammation can also be due to infections, infections due to either viral, bacterial, or even fungal infections. So when there is an inflammation, that inflammation leads to destruction of the bronchial wall, particularly the smooth muscle of the bronchial wall and the elastic tissue. So once this elastic tissue is destroyed, what happens is that there is weakening of the walls of the bronchi and bronchioles and that is a cause for dilatation. A very simple pathogenetic mechanism, obstruction and or infection which leads to destruction of the bronchial wall because of inflammation leading to weakening and then dilatation of the bronchi and bronchioles. So, that is the pathogenetic mechanism of bronchiectasis. Now, how do these patients manifest? The most common presentation of bronchiectasis is severe persistent cough, you know, with expectation of foul smelling copious amount of sputum. 
right dyspnea and orthopnea will be seen in severe cases occasionally there could be life threatening hemoptysis in the process of destruction of bronchi and bronchioles okay even the adjacent blood vessels can also be destroyed so this destroyed blood vessel can have access to the bronchi where the patient manifests with hemoptysis because of long standing persistent infection these patients are almost always having uh, almost always have fever so there could be systemic febrile reaction and what is important to note that the manifestations are often episodic and they are precipitated by upper respiratory tract infections there could be paroxysms of cough which are particularly in the morning when the patient rises you know why that happens that's because the whole night the secretions are pooled when the patient rises suddenly you know these pooled secretion will gain access to the bronchi and bronchioles and that results in paroxysms of cough basically to remove the, remove that or expel that sputum outside the patient will have continuous cough with sputum production let's look into the gross morphological features grossly it's the characteristically the bronchiectasis affects distal bronchi and bronchioles beyond the segmental bronchi it involves lungs either in the segment or diffusely most commonly bilateral lower lobes are involved can you see this these are all the dilated bronchi and bronchioles Pleura is usually fibrotic because of long-standing infection leading to fibrotic reaction. It could be thickened with adhesion to the chest wall. On the cut surface of the lung, the dilated bronchi appear cystic and they are filled with mucopurulent secretions. Because of the cystic nature of the dilated bronchi in the lower lobe, this appearance is referred to as honeycomb appearance. Remember, honeycomb appearance is seen in bronchiectasis. Another important feature of bronchiectasis is how these bronchi and bronchioles are dilated and that comes to understanding the Reed subclassification of bronchiectasis. Dr. Reed was a renowned pathologist. She was a senior resident, you know, when she was working in Australian, Australian medical school. She found out the pathologic features of lung in bronchiectasis patients and then she subclassifies based on the type of dilatation of bronchi and bronchioles into three categories. This is a normal uh, you know, bronchi with its branches. If there is uniform dilatation, she called it as cylindrical type of bronchiectasis. If there is irregular dilatation, it is called as varicose type of bronchiectasis. If it is very large, cystic or saccular, that is referred to as saccular type of bronchiectasis. Remember, this is a morphological classification of bronchiectasis proposed by Dr. Reed. This is Reed subclassification of bronchiectasis. So, moving on to the morphology, microscopically, the bronchial epithelium it can be normal. If the inflammation is not there or infection is less, it could be ulcerated if it is acute inflammation or because of chronic inflammation, it might show squamous metaplastic changes. The wall of the bronchi and bronchioles show infiltration by acute and chronic inflammatory vessels depending upon the type of inflammation, whether it is acute or chronic. Necrosis is often evident, which is the one which destroys the bronchial and bronchiolar walls and Sometimes, you know, the necrotic parenchyma is so much so that it can form abscess with coexistent infection. Fibrosis of the bronchial and bronchiolar walls occurs in long-standing cases and peribronchiolar fibrosis develop in more chronic cases. See, pooling of secretions can be an idus for infections. Also, infection can itself be disposed to, you know, dilatation by means of inflammation. So, this is a vice versa. This is a vicious cycle. So, what type of infections are seen in bronchiectasis? Okay, the most common organisms causing infections in bronchiectasis are the Haemophilus influenzae and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Haemophilus influenzae constituting around 50% of cases, Pseudomonas constituting around 12 to 30% of the cases. In the remaining, the rest of the cases, it could be because of, could be non-tuberculous mycobacteria. It could be Moraxella, it could be Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumonia and Klebsiella species. So, remember, these are the two important infectious agents in found in bronchiectasis, Haemophilus influenza and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
How do you diagnose bronchitis? Almost always it's based on the clinical history and the sputum examination. Chest x-ray could lead you to the diagnosis and high resolution CT scan is very much you know required for confirmation of bronchiectasis. Chest x-ray you find these increased bronchovascular markings. Honeycombing can be observed in severe cases and this high, high resolution CT scan confirms the findings on chest x-ray. Right. How do you treat these patients? Of course, most of these patients can still be smokers. If they are smoking, you have to ask them to stop smoking. The main uh, treatment involves medical and supportive therapy. Surgical treatment plays a minor role. And it plays a role only when the bronchitis is localized and limited and having these complications, right? So, you can tackle surgically, but then the mainstay of the treatment is medical and supportive therapy where you have to treat with antibiotic uh, antibiotics to clear off the pulmonary infections bronchodilators again though the bronchi are dilated in bronchiectasis yet bronchodilators are used to clear the airway basically because there will be obstruction because of mucus infection or could be something else oxygen suppl supplementation is necessary if the patient is hypoxemic and of course if severe hospitalization is important for the control of infection so, once you know that this is a patient of bronchiectasis, you should expect some complications. So, what are the complications? The complications could be mm, the infection can extend and form lung abscess. In the long standing cases, the fibrosis can be predominantly in pulmonary fibrosis, and that pulmonary fibrosis can result in pulmonary hypertension, resulting in chronic or pulmonary, leading to right sided heart failure, and all like. All chronic inflammation, this also, this being a chronic and persistent inflammation, can result in reactive systemic amyloidosis. I have talked in detail about amyloidosis in one few of my videos. You can just go back and then refer those videos to know more about amyloidosis. So that's about bronchiectasis. We looked into the pathogenesis, the clinical features, morphology, the diagnosis, and also the complications of bronchiectasis. Thank you for watching. If you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries to ask. Don't forget to subscribe this channel and do share this video if you find this useful. Wait for the next session where I will be discussing about bronchial asthma. That will be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease part 4. Thank you. Bye-bye.